But welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm excited to chat with you. Uh, we've known each other probably, I think, at least five years now. At least. And uh, it's been a pleasure to be able to learn from you, work with you. And it's been just awesome all around. And today I get the honor to actually dive a little bit deeper into uh, what makes Benton Leong awesome at what he does, which is working with early stage startups. So to start our show off, maybe the first thing we can do is if you can give us a little bit of a background on yourself, kind of where you've come from, a little bit of a history, kind of where you're at and where you're going. And then one thing about you, no one would know. <laughs> I have to think about that. Maybe I'll get to that after I do a little bit of intro. You bet. Uh, so uh, um, I, I was raised in uh, 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 California. I, I grew up in San Francisco. I went across the bay uh, uh, to UC Berkeley, and that's where I did my undergraduate work, uh, both in mathematics and also computer science. And then uh, did my graduate work at, at Penn State and then the University of Arizona. I was recruited to join the University of Waterloo's computer science department and, and joined that faculty. While I was there, I, I worked in, on a research project along with uh, several other academic uh, collaborators on a system for doing mathematics, uh, symbolic mathematics uh, by computer. A and uh, it was uh, uh, one of the first systems that, that actually did something like that and, and was available commercially. We saw ourselves initially as uh, uh, academic researchers. We didn't think that we would be the accidental entrepreneurs that we turned out to be. But so many people found out about the project and then asked for copies of it. And then uh, we charged a little bit of a handling fee for that. And they saw themselves as being customers. So we ended up uh, starting a business. Although at that time in, 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 in the 1980s, we had no intention of doing that. And uh, it's, it's actually a little bit surprising to me that the company succeeded because with six academics running a, a, a commercial company, we didn't even know what we didn't know, right? It, it, it amazes me that we survived. It wasn't until we hired Ron Newman as our first CEO that the company really took off. And so all along the way, I learned things that are deeply embedded in me now, deeply ingrained in me. And, and these are the lessons that I tell young founders who may not see out two or three years about the possible problems that they, they may have from making the wrong mistakes right at the beginning. Beginning, you know, I was there. It happened to me. I've got the scars on my back to prove it. And so, you know, as an angel investor now, uh, people may think that the value that I bring to the table is the small amount of capital that I can provide for them. But actually, it's, it's more the many decades of experience that I've accumulated over the years. So with that company, uh, MapleSoft, we, uh, it was acquired by our Japanese distributor, CyberNet, in 2009. And that was uh, when we uh, founders had what I call our, our happy end stay, right? That, that, that large, big acquisition that everybody hopes for. And with that capital windfall that I was lucky enough to have, I'm really turning that, that, that capital into green capital. I'm recycling it, right? I'm redeploying it with the next generation of entrepreneurs. Uh, and, and I'm there to help them as, uh, as well as supply capital. And so since, uh, since 2009, I've been a very active angel investor. I'm now in multiple angel groups. And uh, just recently, just this uh, past year, uh, some of my colleagues and I have started a, a new angel fund uh, to basically uh, be additive to what individual angel investors are, are uh, supplying to, to uh, new ventures. Awesome. And the one thing about you that uh, nobody knows? That nobody knows. Well, few people know, uh, know, uh, know that, that uh, there are things that I've done in my life that, uh, that, 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 that were very risky. I, I do take risks, and that's, that's uh, reflected in the kinds of investments that I make. Uh, I used to go skydiving. No way. That's yeah. awesome. <laughs> and, 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 and JP, I stopped when I had kids. Right. And I thought, well, maybe after they've grown up, I might resume it. But uh, so far, I haven't. 
Well, it's a fantastic sport. Uh, I've also jumped. I never went into it as a sport, but meaning something I did regularly, but I found it very invigorating. I really did enjoy it, especially the jump part. I'm not <laughs> yes. sure I was really a huge fan of the floating part just because it felt like the world's biggest snuggie that lasted for at least 20 minutes while you were coasting down. But outside that, the landing was a lot of fun and jumping was even more fun. In it's that such a rush. Off. But, you know, I, I, I also enjoyed, you know, floating down. Uh, it's so peaceful. You're up there. It takes quite a bit of time, actually, to come down while, while the chute is open. And you've got time to reflect on things. You're, you're on top of the world just looking around. Agreed. The view's amazing, too. I, I love climbing mountains. So being at the very top by yourself, there's not very many people at the top. And you're just looking around. Sun's coming up. Beautiful. Same thing when you're jumping off a plane, just floating around, looking around, just being like, oh, my God, this world's beautiful. Yes. Oh, that's incredible. Uh, well, there, there's some really amazing things. Well, you've done a lot of amazing things, but there's a lot of uh, um, amazing nuggets that you kind of talked about in your experience that I want to kind of go back and, and talk on, because I think that really the, the, the real core to what makes you who you are are those earlier experiences. And then being able to give those back makes such a huge difference. And you did talk on those. And maybe we could dive into a couple of those things. And sometimes they're the, the failures that you got hit with, or sometimes they're the wins. But what were the, I guess, what's the meat and potatoes that you really took from building something unexpectedly, as you mentioned, but when you started to really dive into this, what got you rolling? Was it the people that were calling looking for this solution and you felt like, wow, I had no idea we had something here? Or was it the drive to go out and continue to build it? What really got you interested in this whole learning as an entrepreneur? Well, I see myself as a builder. Uh, and and so I, 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 I enjoy to a degree uh, helping other people build their companies. But I also enjoy getting my own hands dirty and, and building my own, my own projects, uh, my own tools. And so uh, I, I, I do remember the rush during the early days when all of us were engaged in that and we were very happy to basically keep on improving the, the, uh, the product or, or uh, the, the system. Although these days, I do caution inventors not to just keep on doing that without talking to customers a lot and understanding where the customers need you to take it, right? And I've seen uh, uh, companies fail just simply because the engineers couldn't stop tinkering and improving the product before getting it out into the market, right? So probably the best validation that, that, that what you're doing is right is to have early customers buy it, test it, give you feedback, and to have more customers buy it. That's fantastic advice. And um, I kind of built the statistic in my head that 95% of people that start companies are builders. And there's only 5% that really understand how to sell. So you really have to start to shift that building mentality up so that you're more of a salesperson. Because Absolutely. when you get building, you can't stop. You're like, I'm building the best car in the world. And you're like, wait, <laughs> no one's going to drive this if I don't sell it. Yeah, and, 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 and you get hit with a dose of reality when you actually have to stand out there and try, uh, try to sell something. Mark Castell, who I, who I uh, 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 consider as one of my mentors, uh, used to tell people at Communitech, I don't care if you're the CEO. I don't care if you are the, MS, uh, the CMO. I don't care what your title is. I want all of you that I'm helping stand out there in the corner uh, in downtown Kitchener, one block away from Communitech, and I want you to sell the pastor pies something, and I want you to understand how hard that is. Yep. Brilliant lesson. And you should. Everybody should. All the way from the person that answered that telephone to the person that answered an email all the way up to everybody should be learning how to sell because you should be proud and excited about the company you're part of. And that's the first line is, I work for this company and I should know exactly what we do. And that's your first sell. Right. And what this product is. And, 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 and never mind talking about all oh, its wonderful features. Basically, how is it going to change that customer's life? What are the benefits? Right. And, and, and you know, a person who does that so well is uh, uh, the late Steve Jobs, right? I consider him to be one of the consummate business communicators. When he got onto that stage, you know, by the time that he walked off, whatever it was that he was talking about, you wanted it. You didn't realize that you needed it, but you wanted it. Right? 
uh, and, and he does that not by extolling all the versions of Bluetooth or, or 802.11 that are embedded inside. He talks about how it's going to change your life, how it's going to make it easier, or how you'll be able to communicate better, or how you'll be able to find information faster, or entertain yourself, right? And, 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 and he, he didn't pay a, a lot of attention to all of the engineering details. He made it applicable to the user and figured out what the user wanted before they actually felt they needed it. Yeah. And I think that makes a big difference in your product planning, but also in your sales side of things is that if you can stay ahead of the consumer and knowing where the consumer is going to go and being able to adopt to that beforehand, you can carry that life uh, product life cycle all the way along and can keep feeding the engine. So you'll keep growing and be relevant along the way. Right. And to be able to explain it so that people can understand. And, and one test that I, I uh, or one challenge that I give to uh, founders is, I want you to come back with your grandmother saying, I want this. Yep, that's awesome. And, and when you were going through this journey of building this company and you had um, that original team and the co-founders and everybody putting this together, did you find that your growth and the opportunity of growing, growing and scaling was because you had co-founders? Did it make a difference in your journey? And when you look at companies today, are you looking for companies that have co-founders or are you saying, you know what, single founders, they're awesome, but I really do need this other element to make this a success? You absolutely do. And, and yes, we had a fairly large team of co-founders. There were seven of us uh, originally. And when I take a look at, at uh, uh, new companies that are being incubated today, I am looking for that almost complete team, right? Of people who have an artistic bent, people who, who can communicate well, people who understand marketing and how to get to market, as well as the engineers and the scientists and the inventors and the people who code, right? And, and, and it may not be that complete team yet. And if they want our help uh, uh, using our and networks uh, in the ecosystem to help them find, you know, that, 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 that right marketing person uh, for this stage of the company, we can do that. Uh, and sometimes they may not realize it, but, but, but they may need uh, some executive brain power, some, some experience help that, that they don't have on the team. Maybe that's also a part of the missing uh, uh, complement to, to the team. And we can, we can help there. But it's very rare that, that, that we would invest in a, a single person. And I've worked as a mentor with single founders, and they agree with me that, you know, Benton, you're right. Uh, I do need someone else to balance what I do. And I said, OK, let me introduce a few people to you that I think can help you. And if the first candidate doesn't work out, well, you know, maybe the chemistry wasn't right. And then you bring another one on. Well, for different reasons, she didn't work out. She wasn't the right one. He wasn't either, right? And after, after three or four attempts, you come to realize it's really this, this founder can't work well with other people or is too greedy, is unwilling to give up equity in his or her company to share with others. And when you have a person that is so controlling or so self-centered, I don't think that that person can can really lead a good strong team. No, that sounds uh, uh, very valuable. And I think as you start to grow with people, and, and like you said, you can bring co-founders in throughout that idea and through that ideation and growth process, and and find people that really do gel. And your team is going to mold mold around you as well. So you're going to start finding like-minded people and start building that culture. And when you were in that in your company doing this, and you were building forward. Was there a point in time where you guys hit a wall and you kind of started, you know what, we need to shake things up. We need to do things a little bit differently today. You know what, we've been doing this for five years, 10 years, whatever that time was. And did you find you having to make changes in the way you looked at your business? Yeah, I, I would say, uh, uh, Jeffrey, that, that we probably weren't the, the model, uh, model founder team to, uh, for other people to aspire to becoming, you know, uh, all of the team members came from uh, academia, from the university. We're, we were research scientists, mathematicians, uh, and, and very good at it, right? But there weren't enough of us 
that were able to cross in in my my mind our chasm from from the university into the business world and those people are very valuable if you can find them the the, the ones that understand the engineering the deep engineering uh the deep science and at the same time are would be able to lead a company and 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 and, and speak to business people instead of looking down at them which is often a, 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 a trait amongst the uh, uh, academics. So, but, 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 you know, pe- people who can straddle those two sides, they're very valuable. And, and those are the people that I, I look to, 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 to lead companies. Uh, were we the ones who had done that? No, uh, we were very weak on that in, in our founder team. We had to go outside to find someone who was very good. Ron Newman, who, who was our first real CEO to, to lead the company. And uh, we learned from him. I I I, um, I learned all about contracts and and uh, OEM licensing from from people like uh, Ron and and the lawyers that we had. And that really ties into it. And I, I love where you're going with that because a lot of that founder side or team side, it really does. You have to look at those weaknesses and your strengths and kind of figure out where that balance is. And I know in a, a lot of the interviews and a lot of the things that you've done in the past, which I've learned from, which I think are awesome, um, was that you talk about mentoring and you talk about how mentoring can really benefit you. And I know you do a lot of this now in the last 10, 12 years of being a, an investor. How did you, did you utilize that when you were building your company? Was it again, something that you may have had and maybe no one else did, but because you had a different look on your business, you started to utilize that early? Uh, you obviously learned from the first CEO, but was there other things that you did to kind of keep those tools sharp? Um, you know, during the early, you have to remember that that during the time that that we were getting our company launched, it was in the 1980s. There weren't a lot of other people to learn from. I I, I can't say that we looked around for best practices and adopted them. Uh, in fact, there were no angel investors uh, during that time, no VCs. Uh, uh, we all took out uh, second mortgages on our homes in order to uh, be the seed capital for the company. I showed my wife the uh, bench in Waterloo Park, and I told her that you know if this company f- goes under, the bank will repossess our house, and this is the bench that we'll be sleeping underneath, and you should be okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> That's the risk. So it was true, true risk capital. I mean, uh, uh, we didn't have very much in the way of safety nets. We didn't rely on on you propping up our company with other people's money. We didn't have people to really sort of guide and mentor us. But there's a lot of learning from that, right? And I think you can you really utilize that part of it. And like you utilize the mentoring side, you may not have had it, but you created your own principles. You created your own guidelines. And that's what allowed you to continue to move and morph throughout time. And now, like 12 years later, you're looking at this going, hey, man, I can bring all of this into helping early stage companies really figure it out because we went through the hardest part of it. And now there's so many different avenues, tools, businesses, non-for-profits, so Support many things. Organizations, incubators, exactly. Uh, but but uh, the business people that I really admire are, are those who, who have gone through a lot of challenges and 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 somehow those challenges didn't defeat them they managed to come through and learned along the way and and so i i'll have to say that 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 things haven't been easy and i uh, you know, i've made lots of mistakes and i've struggled uh but in the end uh, i i managed to emerge but i learned from it and 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 i see this with other people who are who are in business agreed there was, um, I was having this conversation yesterday and I threw this kind of angle to it. And when you're looking at this co-founder side, you know, that I, I'm going to say that there's probably this 60%, 70% of um, founders that go into more of the technical space. Uh, they may not have that same business acumen and understanding. Um, so they'll look for that person that does carry that sales or um, more front-facing style of leadership. And right. then when you have a business person that comes into this market, they're looking for this co-founder because they don't understand really how that co-founder start, uh, um, technical side works. And what I loved about the business person finding this co-founder is that I find that these two uh, entities coming together really makes for a real strong business. And when it's a business leader running it with a technical co-founder, 
And the reason why I find that this being a good mix is that you have a really strong person going out and selling. But what I find from myself being a technical person, software engineer, et cetera, is that I could look at a business from the ground up right. and I can see how everything moves, operates, and functions. Whereas a business person is always looking down into the business, trying to figure out how these things work, but in speed and time, it doesn't work as effective. So they really do depend on that technical person and technical people tend to be more open to just share things right away. Uh, they're like, I don't want to do this extra work. So I'm just going to tell you how it is. Right. So do you find that that same kind of scenario works in today's environment that uh, it really does make a difference to have somebody really hyper-focused on that technical side of your business because everything's kind of going that way. Well, a absolutely. Because, you know, the, the, the companies that I do focus on, the companies that, that I gravitate towards are, are, are based on technology and, and, and based on uh, a, a generally deep technology, which other people can't uh, copy easily, right? And the businesses that I, I look to are, are those who are, understand how to exploit technology for that definitive advantage that they have over others or that use technology as a way of really sort of getting to the market faster, that understand how to take advantage of it. Th th those are the people that are the winners. Uh, but you know that, that, that relationship from the, the technical people on the team and the business uh, people on the team, you know, whether they're looking up or down, there's got to be respect amongst them. Right. And and all too many a time I, I've been involved in companies or I've mentored companies where uh, uh, the business people didn't have much respect for the uh, for the engineers. And we're always blaming them for holding things up. And the engineers were coming back saying this business person has no sense of how hard it is for us to build this. He has no respect for what we're doing. He's just simply riding on coattails of our success, our invention. The guy's a parasite. So, <laughs> so unless you have that mutual respect, I, I, I don't think that that company is going to do very well. You're always going to be at loggerheads with each other. And you have to understand that, that there are things that you don't understand and you'll have to trust uh, the judgment of others. If you can find that amongst a, a, a team of three or four co-founders and they work well together, you know, that, 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 that's going to make for a very successful company. Agreed. And there's a lot of compatibility that has to go in there, right? It takes time to, to build that relationship, understand each other's strengths and weaknesses to, to move forward. Right. So when you, when you got into moving yourself and shifting and selling your business, um, could you maybe talk to a little bit of what the learnings were from that? Because I think today it's pretty relevant. There's a lot more commerce happening, more transactions are happening. Companies are trying to sell or at least grow quickly. So when you guys got to that stage, what did it look like? Was it a one to two year process? Was it an M&A takeover where you had a outside entity come in and look at the business and you guys had to spend time shaping it to get it ready? How did that process go and what kind of learnings did you take from that? So uh, I wasn't with the company anymore by the time that it was acquired and it was acquired by a, a, a friendly party, uh, Cybernet, uh, a, a, our Japanese distributor. Uh, it was uh, Cybernet understood our business inside and out because of the fact that they were the dominant Asian distributor for our product. And what they saw was that whereas we've all come from an academic background and sold into the education space and to the universities well, we weren't penetrating the commercial market as well as some of the other companies in the same space. And they said, we know that are our customers in the aeronautics space and in automo uh, automotive would really be able to make use of this. And we know how to sell to them. And we know how to push you into that right direction. So we're going to make an offer to, to buy this company for you. And we're going to take it in. We're going to basically let you handle academic sales or keep to your core strengths. But what we want to do is to hire additional people to really take it into those application areas where, in fact, there's a lot more revenue to be made in the commercial space than the education space. I like it. And was there, while you guys were, I know this was after your time, but when you guys started, did you look at that as an acquisition? Did you look at partners as being your acquisition? 
Uh, was that something that you put in your four, uh, your rear view mirror, didn't care, just hustle forward? Or was it something you were planning for? Well, I, know the time that I, w I was with the company you know, un until about uh, 1999 or 2000. Uh, we didn't have an, uh, a, 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 an exit plan. N nobody even discussed, you know, how do we exit from this? We've got to remember, you're talking to some of the original founders, the people who built the business. This is their baby. I, 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 I don't think that, that some of us ever thought that we would be leaving our baby or walking away from it. So uh, certainly with that group, there was not a lot of thought that, that went into, you know, how do we sell the business or do we go into an IPO? Right? Uh, uh, but uh, uh, the uh, CEO who, who had taken over uh, a you know, during the 2000s, uh, certainly did restructure the business a bit, clean it up, and and uh, and then and then the Japanese distributor came along and said, you know, we really like this, and we want to make a we want to purchase it. Oh, that's awesome! So in that time where you kind of shifted, and I think you were one of the original G10 members, so that 12 years back. So that's in right. that kind of small gap, you went through a couple other businesses, bought and sold throughout that time. Uh, is there a couple of things that you could share to the audience that you learned from as being an entrepreneur and, and going through that buying and selling process that could really kind of emphasize, you know, while you're starting a company and where you're going to end up, to always remember these kind of few points, whatever that might be, uh, focus on the end goal, where you're trying to get to, uh, look for that exit at the beginning. So figure out who that company is that you want to get bought by and shape your business to kind of fit into that mold. Like, are there certain things that you would kind of uh, really allude to that would help a startup better understand where they got to put their vision. Right. You know, so, so in that, in that interim period between the time that I had left MapleSoft and then, and then became doing angel investing full time, uh, I started a, a, a few businesses, uh, but uh, they grew, they only grew to a certain degree and then they didn't sort of uh, uh, become as successful as, as MapleSoft did. Uh, and, and I do think back about those years and I wonder, you know, was I too hard on my co-founders? Were they too hard on me? Uh, we, we had some success to a degree. We worked with publishers uh, as partners, uh, but things didn't quite gel and, and, and really work out to become, you know, large successes. So can you figure out, are there certain things like being hard or being not hard? Is there certain things that really kind of uh, morphed your... Uh, direction that you were going in? Is it um, that you could do things differently or that if you were to start something today, here's three things you would do no matter what, because they really made a difference in your propelling yourself forward because you're mentoring every day now, right? And right, you're offering right. so much valuable advice to people. So, and they grow their companies and you've got an amazing portfolio. So what are those types of things that you can look out for and investors can look out for? Right. So, so, you know, in, in terms of, uh, inventions and, and ideas, uh, you, have to, you have to bring them to the market. You have to develop them and bring them to the market at just the right time, right? If you're too late, right, then you're just following everybody else and you're struggling to catch up. If you're too early, and I would say that we were probably too early in terms of creating interactive uh, 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 books that, 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 that were on electronic readers, uh, that 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 were educational books or textbooks. We were probably too early during the early two thousands. So 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 there is that too, right? You can yeah. have all the greatest ideas in the world, but when the market and 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 the customers aren't ready for that yet, then you're not quite at where you need to be. Right at the front of the wave, the wave hasn't has hasn't even started traveling in that direction yet. You see it. You see it in the future, but for you to spend a lot of time and an effort creating those products when there isn't a need to buy them yet, then you're too early. Mm. So, so you, you don't want to be too early. You don't want to be too late. The timing has to be just right for you to be just right at the front of the wave. So I guess if you take that um, experience and the, uh, what you've just shared and you tie that into the current market of NFTs, and how they're taking off like crazy right now, would you look at that as uh, at the peak of the market or so early that, you know what, startups should be jumping in this. If you've got an idea, just hustle it out now because you're at, right at the peak of this market break. Right, 
Right. So uh, I, I, I don't know if I would be the best person to judge that, uh, uh, Jeffrey. I, I would say that right now with NFTs, you know, you're, you're right. You're in front of the wave. Are you one or two years ahead of it? Or are you just one or two quarters ahead of it? And therefore, you're going to do really well. The, yeah, I, I would be the wrong person to answer that. I, I, I haven't really sort of lived it enough to be able to give you a, a, a good sense from, from deep within me. Fair enough. The, and you know that the, 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 um, this whole NFT market has been around for like three, four years. It just couldn't get the traction. The same thing with your the uh, audio books that you created way before that anybody was used to listening to audio. Uh, and then COVID kind of helped propel this, but Bitcoin and blockchain actually helped it propel it even more because all of a sudden blockchain, or sorry, Bitcoin became such a popular way to make fast coin and dollars that everybody needed to spend it on something. So then these digital assets became this hidden gem of value and everybody started to kind of feed the engine. So it right. kind of feels like it's right at the cusp of this breakout going crazy. We're hearing about it a lot. And of course, who are the people that started it or big uh, money providers into this is the same people that fought Facebook and the same people that own all the Bitcoin. The right. Big Lost Brothers. I'm saying their name wrong, but right. Right. Yeah. yeah right. No, so, you know, it's been around a long time and it, it, it's yeah. really starting to take off now. But let me ask you this, uh, 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 Jeffrey, are, are, are people putting money into, into Bitcoin or, or cryptocurrency more for the utility or more for the speculation? Personally, I'm going to say it's speculation. I don't think it has yeah. any value at this point in time that anybody's been able to figure out how to utilize it. Yes. It is pure speculation. And it's, I think the, uh, uh, what's that guy's name on MSNBC? I think, um, the dog pound or the dog, whatever the investor's name is, he just bought a house and said that he paid off or paid off his house using Bitcoin uh, because that that was the the usage of it. And he's like, I might be the first one to sell, but I think it's at its peak. So that's kind of an interesting concept, right? Somebody right. else is throwing that out there, and everybody else is just keeps pushing it forward. Right. Well, you know, uh, uh, people see that the the crazy uh, 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 increase in value. Of, of things like Bitcoin or Ethereum. And, and I think it's the fear of missing out. I, I, I better jump in now because it's still going up, still going up, right? Yep. Uh, but how many people, you know, do, do you personally know, personally know who have actually taken advantage of the Bitcoins that they have and used it for something? I, I don't know anybody that's used it for anything. Uh, I was talking about this yesterday and I was like, it's in a wallet. I don't even care to look at it. Right. What am I going to do with it? Tomorrow it'll be worth ten times more. It'll be worth ten times less. So it's just sitting there, I guess. So, <laughs> and 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 you know, uh, my my worry is that I'm a forgetful person, Jeffrey. So I'm afraid of losing all the value in my wallet just simply because I've I've forgotten the key, you know, the key password or whatever. Yeah, forgot to log in and use it. Yeah, it it is uh, it is a fascinating space, and there is a lot more uh, FOMO going on these days than there ever has been. And I'm not sure if, again, because we have bigger, better vehicles to market the world, but it seems to be really changing the way people are reactionary. And, and uh, I'm, I'm a huge herd mentality uh, player in what we do. So I do believe that that does lead a lot of it. And hopefully uh, it goes down the right path and not the wrong path. And right. I guess that's as, that's as best as we can play that one. But, you know, out, outside of uh, cryptocurrency, there's just so much that's going on that that uh, is so revolutionary in the area of fintech. And today I looked at, 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 at uh, one or two companies in the insure tech space. There's a lot of innovation that's going on there that, that's really changing things. And uh, I, I think that, that also related to that is uh, the big revolution in terms of uh, taking advantage of unused capital assets. That, that we see with Uber and that, that we see with Airbnb. And, and so people are using those models to say, what other unused capital assets are we, are, are, are we not really taking advantage of? And how do we capitalize on them? So do you think that with the startup uh, changes that are occurring right now with COVID and everybody sitting around having more time to think and come up with better innovations and better ideas, do you think that 
it's getting into a bubble state like we had in 2007 with the financial or 2001 with the original uh, dot com uh, blow up. Do you think that they're getting into that state because everybody's finding a way to monetize every single thing, every aspect of your life, everything around you? Do you think that that's bringing because that's going to hit um, head on somewhere? Or do you think it's just going to keep going that there's now there's just too much awakening around money and everybody right. wants it? Whereas before it was okay to have a job, it was okay to be an entrepreneur, but not really. And today now it's be an entrepreneur, come up with something innovative and win. So how, how do you feel that's all rotating? Well, you know, as you said, COVID, the pandemic has given some people some some time to sort of stay home and think about things and and and, and uh, think about what they'd like to do uh, that others may not have thought of yet. I think that once we emerge from the pandemic and can circulate freely again, uh, uh, some percentage of those of those ideas and of those uh, ventures will fall by the wayside because they really haven't been tested during the pandemic, right? There's not been a lot of uh, 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 chances for many people to, to randomly run into to other people and, and, and ask them, what do you think about this? Can you help validate this idea? Or people to go to uh, uh, sets of customers and, and, and test this out. I think, I think that that will be done once we start circulating and we'll find out, you know, some of those ideas weren't as good as, uh, as the inventors thought they were. Some will succeed, no doubt. There's a lot of, I guess, hopefully a lot of practicality that will come out over the next year or two as things start to settle down a bit. Yeah, but, but you know, in, 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 in a certain way, I think that we won't go back to the world that we left. Uh, uh, we've gotten used to new ways of working. So it's certainly going to have huge impact, is already having huge impact in terms of commercial real estate, in terms of, uh, of the office situation. Uh, I can't say that, that, that we, we will never work in a central office. And I can't say that we will always go, we will go back to that model where everybody came into an office nine to five. It's going to be somewhere in between. Right, but exactly where it is that uh, 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 where that needle lies, sort of on the meter in between, I I, I don't know. Uh, but what it has allowed is is what what is promoted is the idea that you can find people to work with and not be in the same city as they are in, or not be in the same office as they are in. And I think that we will continue to enjoy that mixed into our uh, uh, our normal way of working with people that we see on a face-to-face -face basis. So to touch on that again, and, and we're kind of diverting a bit from the whole concept of uh, startups and, and entrepreneurship, but just more from a curiosity standpoint, with this diversing of being able to work with people around the world, are you finding that this has elevated the game in education? This has elevated the game in being able to find more talented people to bring in, which will actually allow for innovation to move even faster. Uh, absolutely. So uh, you you know that that for startups uh, that can't afford uh, top level executives at the C suite, that there have been sort of uh, services that offer fractional executives. A, a fractional CFOs have been around for, for a while. Many, many companies are used to using them, but I know a company that's actually offering a fractional CTO service and, and, and they bring in uh, uh, people who've led fairly large companies in terms of their technical development. And, 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 and these are uh, executives who are now looking at their second careers and they've joined companies where they can offer a, a portion of their time to startups, maybe a day a week. Uh, and they may not be even in the same city as, as the company is in. So uh, uh, I, I think that, that that notion of fractionalizing executives combined with the fact that it's now easier to work with people from afar is, is leading to, to, to basically uh, a, a more success in terms of adding people to your team who may not be in the same city that you're in. I love that. And what came into my mind right when you were sharing that was that when I started my first company uh, close to 15 years ago, 
I remember sitting in, uh, it was actually a brew pub. And one of the investors said to me, you need to get an office. <laughs> and I was like, what do I need an office for? Well, because when you get purchased, they're going to need to have all of you in a room. They're going to need all that brain power. They need to know where it is. They need to be able to write it down and see everybody that's in there, register this whole thing. And I still couldn't get my head around it. I'm like, one, I don't want to be in an office, but I really don't understand why this has to be in one spot. And which is fascinating because I never got an office. 15 years later, we had offices in other countries uh, because we're in Pakistan and Philippines, but we never eventually we got rid of those offices. So it was distributed everywhere. But now you're, we've gone through this whole cycle and now we're actually in an environment where your whole team is distributed. And now you're looking at it going, I need to go in and buy company A. <laughs> okay, where is everybody? Well, we're in 14 countries. We don't own one office and uh, everybody lives and works from home. So you're, I wonder, and I'm curious on how you see this rolling out for when that purchase is, because yes, you've got inventory. Yes, you're tying into all of these other entities that are doing things. But if the whole thing is distributed, is there a lack of control in the mindset of the purchaser that they don't have the brains and everything in one room? Or do they feel more comfortable that it's so distributed? It's, it's going to be harder to assess that very widely distributed team. Because one of the things that, that, that we say amongst angel investors is if you're going to invest in a company, you know, at the very least, you need to make a site visit and get an understanding of what the vibe of the place is. Are people working hard or, you know, okay. are they all disappearing at five o'clock? Do they have that kind of mentality or are they sleeping underneath the desks at three, three o'clock in the morning? You know, how hard do they work? What's the vibe? How, how do they work with one another do you sense that there's antagonism in in, in, in the office right so we we walk around and, and and we talk to people but how do you do that when everybody's spread so far apart you know, it, it it becomes harder to arrange for these you know one-on-ones with maybe the top 10 or 15 people uh in, in the company but you know, companies were just you know, by the time that that a larger corporation buys a company, I would hope that, in fact, it does have multiple offices throughout the world. I mean, we, we, we are not growing purely Canadian companies that serve purely the Canadian uh, uh, market, right? It, it really behooves us to, to, to find much larger markets than the Canadian market, right? to, to become export companies, to have offices in Asia and in Europe, Right. Now, uh, uh, Maplesoft did. You know, we had we had not only distributors all over the world and in, in, and I think 30 different distributors throughout the world. But we also had a, a, a European office and, and, and an Asian office. So when when a larger corporation comes in to evaluate your company, I would hope that you've got m multiple offices. But do you think that the company is defined by their office or they're defined by their people? Or are they defined by the asset that they hopefully own in these other areas? Because that brings a bigger value to the company. Right. Um, it's an asset buy plus it's a resource buy. But if you don't have those things, does that bring the valuation down? Because if you're just a platform and, hey, you've got a virtual office in all these other countries, does that still bring you the same value and take on your company? I'm going to kind of guess it just falls down to the numbers. So none of that will really matter anymore. Uh, well, I, I think that it's the nature of the business that will determine the right answer there. I don't think that there's any single right answer. If you're in manufacturing, you know, you're certainly going to have capital assets and, and equipment, uh, uh, and, and hopefully you have them in the right places in the world. When you're creating, you know, intangible IP like software is, where does, where does it really reside other than in the heads of people? And uh, in the cloud, right? So for that, it, it may not matter as much. For sure. Awesome. Well, I love where we were going with that. I think we, I, that was fascinating. And I think there's a lot to learn and peel back on that when you're growing your company. Who knows where you end up? But when you're uh, decentralizing your workforce and building into other countries, outside of the numbers running in and out and paying taxes in each of those countries, maybe <laughs> that's all you need to grow a company and make it look different. And and uh, coming from our end, that's what we've done. And I think it, uh, it you're, I, I'm not sure what it looks like in five years or when there's an exit, but I won't even bother looking at that right now. But I right. can understand that this would probably be a complicated story for some uh, individuals looking to sell today. 
Yeah, but but you know, it, it, it gives you more flexibility, right? Uh, in terms of growing this kind of an organization. Agreed. And uh, uh, so, yeah. I think the brain power helps too. I, I do think that there's so many skill sets that we don't have as Canadians that we can pull around the world. And I think that's the most valuable part to being decentralized. A absolutely. Well, you find the talent wherever they are. Agreed. Well, one of the, we're going to kind of shift a little bit here. We're going to go into our rapid fire questions in, in just a second. I got one last question for you because I know you're going to have a rock star uh, use case or a story for us, uh, which is probably best. But one of the things that we always like to ask and, and learn a bit more about is that in this investment journey that you've gone through, you've probably talked with thousands of companies and you've got to learn a lot about them. Is there a question that really stands out to you that just pops in your mind right away that is about just a fantastic story that just blew your mind about what it takes to be an entrepreneur and what a company or what someone had to do just to win and that you couldn't be more proud of this, this, this story? Yeah, so uh, I was an early investor in the company uh, uh, Fix, which got its start under the name of Maintenance Assistant. It was started by Mark Castell, who, who I mentioned earlier. Uh, Mark had been uh, a, uh, uh, a mentor at Communitech. He had been an investment director at OCE. He had been an angel investor with GTAN. And incredibly, he actually held all these titles at the same time. So he was, he was a renaissance man that could do everything and anything and do it all at the same time. When he started his company, I think that the angels that we added to his board, you know, their, their, their tough job was to get Mark to focus on just simply the one company, to drop his associations with all the other things that he loved to do and to focus. And uh, to his credit, he did, and he managed to really sort of grow the uh, company in a phenomenal way. And just last year, we, we celebrated the, uh, the exit from, from, from that company. When it got sold to an American company, uh, the returns to the investors were you know, 20x, 30x, 40x, 50x, depending on, on when you got in. It, it was a successful victory for, for everybody. And the company's still in uh, uh, Toronto with, with the same people. Uh, no one's been let go. And, and, and in fact, they've gotten more resources to grow even bigger and faster. So I think that it's a, a, a true, true success story for, for Canada. Uh, That's awesome. Yep. So, so when you have someone who is, who is uh, so bright and has such enthusiasm for so many things, then it becomes the job of the people who work around with him or, or, or who support him to try to get, get that person to sort of focus on at least this one thing for the next, let's say, three to five years. I love it. No, that's a great story. Great story. All right. Now we're going to jump into rapid fire questions. Yes, sir. All right. Why do you invest in early stage companies? Because th this gives me the uh, a chance to influence the company. Uh, one, the most at a time when I think that they need it the most. How did you get started with early stage companies? Uh, uh, through exposure to to companies at places like Community Cap or the Accelerator Center in, in Waterloo. And now, you know, to, to, to quite a few places, uh, the, the Health Innovation Hub in Toronto, uh, uh, the, uh, the Hatchery at, at U of T. So, so I, I, I find early stage companies everywhere and I, I just love work, working with them. And what was the, what triggered you to, to look at this asset class versus retiring or going somewhere and starting another company? What got you like, what turned the switch? And you were like, I love this. Well, I think, I think that I can have the biggest impact by helping multiple companies rather than focusing all of my uh, energy on uh, a single company. Awesome. Uh, what is your favorite part of investing? It's when the uh, founder realizes something that he or she didn't know before and under, understands the, the importance and the impact of that when that light comes on and then, and then we're talking the same thing. So we're, we're, we're using the same language. We're, we're talking about the same concepts. 
Sometimes it takes a little while to get there before you have that meeting of the minds. But when that happens, that's a, that's a, that's a magical moment. The aha moment. Yes. I love it. Uh, how many companies do you invest in per year? Uh, when I was doing it uh, by myself within an angel group, I'd say probably about three to four companies a year. Uh, now that I'm a GP in a fund, we're looking to invest in uh, about 10 companies a year. Awesome. Love it. Uh, any verticals you want to focus on or you like to focus on? My, my background is in educational technology because of the fact that, that, that I used to teach in a university. Uh, but, but I like many sectors. So I would say I'm, I'm fairly agnostic. It's more the idea and it's chance to be transformative that, that captures my imagination rather than, oh, it's got to be in ag tech or it's got to be in fintech. Uh, I, I've invested all over. Well, I've sat in the room with you many times on picking and talking to companies that I can say that one skill that more people need to get into or learn is how to ask more questions. And uh, Benton, you always ask a lot of great questions, which I think helps that entrepreneur open their mind up to understanding what they really have or what they're really working on. Thank you. On the due diligence side, are there things that you look for that make a big difference? Well, Many people say it, and, and so I, I will uh, just simply uh, uh, say it once again, it is the team, right? Uh, you can have the best idea uh, in the world, but unless you've got a team to execute well, it's not going to go anywhere. And uh, uh, I, as you know, grew up in the U.S. Uh, where uh, there are so many people who do such a great job in marketing and promotion there compared to people in Canada. And uh, my, my friends and I, on both sides of the border, will always say, give me a, a, a level marketing with a B-level product rather than an A-level product with B-level marketing. I love it. I love it. A-team with a B-product, you can do a million things with it. Yes. Um, is there a timeline for investments? One week, two months from the first call? I, I would say you, uh, you need to give yourself enough time to really sort of dig in and understand the business. And sometimes the, the founders are reluctant to tell you things that they're afraid may drive you away. I would rather than the founders be completely open so that I have a chance of understanding what the weaknesses are. Not that it might deter me, but that it might be able to give me a chance to say, how can I help this company? So that conversation usually takes a few weeks to kind of unfold. Uh, the fastest that I've actually decided to invest in a company is, is about one week. The longest generally is about 30 to 60 days. Okay. And I, I would say for angel investors, set as a uh, target the fact that you would close within 60 days. I like it. It's a good number. I'd say 30 if uh, it was easier to rope everybody in. But 60 yeah. is a good start. Uh, do you, is there outside of the team, are there any other factors that you look for that make, a, make you cross the line? Is it the innovation? Is it the CEO? Is there uh, paperwork? Anything like that? It, it, I, I would say it's innovation that can be protected somehow, whether it's it's uh, having really uh, really strong alliances with industry leaders as one defensive barrier, or it's through IP protection, through patents as a as a different type of a, uh, a, a, a defensive moat. So there's there's got to be something. It can't be something that's easy to copy, right? And and sometimes what I will do is I'll ask the 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 founders how long did it take for you to come up with this and bring it to this level of fruition. And they tell telling, oh, it, it took us three months working in Joe's basement, right? And, and, and how much money did you expend doing that? Oh, about $300. I was like, oh my God, anybody, anybody can do this. <laughs> That's a good question. I like that. Uh, any preferred terms that you like? Pref shares, common? No, generally common because it puts me on the, the same footing as the founders. 
uh, I I I, lo- I like a balance of something that's investor friendly and 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 uh, founder friendly. I I generally don't like safes because they're so one sided. Amen. Uh, do you take do you lead rounds and do you take board seats? Uh, yes and yes. Awesome. So I uh, uh, I think instead of leading rounds all the time for deals that I've been in, I've I've done it enough. What I really need to do is to help build uh, the number of people who are good deal leads, right? So uh, I I might even go into a deal where I don't intend to invest, but I would like to sort of lead if someone would 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 uh, be my partner in 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 doing the deal and then learn to lead himself or herself. I like it. That's good. Educate everybody brings the whole brings everybody up. Right. Love it. Uh, okay, last question. Do you do follow-on investments? Uh, I have. Uh, uh, I generally try to spread my capital uh, into a larger portfolio so it is more diversified. But in the case that the companies that I've invested in actually need that small bridge in order to, to, to extend the runway so that they can get to the Series A or beyond, uh, I have considered follow-on investment. Okay, perfect. Okay, we're going to jump into the personal side. So a couple personal questions and then, uh, yeah, we're good to go. So first personal question. Sure. What's your favorite sports team? I don't have one. Uh, I, don't, I don't follow sports much. So uh, I, I re- uh, I, I'm trying to think of the last time that I've actually watched either a live game or a televised game. It's been years, Jeffrey. That's okay. We, I find it a way of, uh, it's a way of bonding. A lot of people have a team, they don't have a team, or they remember having a team when they were a kid. So it just kind of brings out the conversation, but that's good. Uh, I, I, I followed the San Francisco Giants when I was growing up in, in, in San Francisco, but that was a long time ago. Well, they were- And, a, the, and the Niners. Yeah, they're a good team. Yep, that's awesome. Okay, question number two. What is your favorite movie and what star, what character would you play in the movie? <laughs> That's a tough one. All the movies that I've seen. And I'm trying to think of the most impactful movie. I'm drawing a blank here, Jeffrey. So here's another question. I guess I'll, I'll have to pass because I can't think of one right now. I, I, I love the old Hitchcock movies, right? I, uh, I was a big fan of, of, of watching Hitchcock. Uh, well, there was one with birds. What was that one? Birds. <laughs> yeah, there was one that he had that was on uh, the topic it, or subject was on birds. I can't remember, but there was. Yeah. I'm going to have to look it up now quickly. Hitchcock. I think Sean Connery was in that one. And. Uh, who else? Who was the actress? It was actually called Birds, but it's uh, the Birds. It was the a Birds. The trailer. Birds. Yeah, and uh, it was um, Tippy Hedren, Ross yes. Taylor, Veronica right. Cartwright, Jessica Tandy. Jessica Tandy. That would probably be the the big one there. Right. Yeah, that's the one I remember the most of uh, most of Hitchcock stuff. But okay, so so. Of those characters in the film, who would you have been, Jeffrey? Oh, geez. That's not an easy one. Uh, I I guess you could have been the hero, uh, which would would have been Rod Taylor. Yeah. I remember uh, uh, Hitchcock made a cameo appearance in that movie, as he does with many of his movies. I I, I think that he was either coming into the shop or bird shop or coming out of it. and, And there was a cable car in the background. Yep, yep, he does. I remember him making that that scene for sure. Uh, I'm gonna have to watch it again because I could I can't remember which character I'd play in it. I haven't probably seen this one, and I used to do a lot of old Hitchcock film because we used to go to um, TIFF and uh, did a lot of stuff through TIFF, and uh, I remember watching a lot of Hitchcock's material. But I'd have to think on that one which character I would play. It, it's one movie. that I probably would watch every six or eight years. You know, just bring it back out from the library and, and, and watch it once again. It doesn't get old. Nope. 
No, agree. No, most of his stuff doesn't, right? Right. Uh, the other one that I, I probably would say in that time frame that, that pops out is like a Marlon Brando with uh, like a streetcar named Desire. Like those ones were all classic, really well done movies that just stand the taste of time. Right. Yeah. Well, all right. So uh, we can rehash movies all day because I'm a big fan <laughs> of all types of movies. Um, the, the last, I guess the last question I would then jump into is what is your superpower? And that can be business, personal, anything, but just what really defines something that you really have this, man, I'm really good at this. This really defines how I do something in a day or a week or anything I analyze or do, whatever that might be. I, I think it would be the ability to relate to another person and to be sympathetic rather than to be judgmental. I like it. You can emphasize or, or you have a strong empathy to work with people and understand them. So right. it allows you to be not bearing, but very, and not confrontational, but very educational, learning right. and working with them. Yeah. And, and I guess that you know, I am always an educator at heart. Yep. I can see that. I can see that. Well, it, uh, it certainly does align up in today's discussion. And Benton, uh, like I said at the beginning, super big fan, uh, glad and excited that we got to chat today. Uh, I learned a lot. I think the audience is going to learn a lot. And we like to end the show with uh, giving you the last word, which is anything that you want to share to a startup, to the entrepreneur community, to investors. I leave it to you to kind of give us the last thoughts. But again, thank you very much for your time today. You were fantastic. Well, thanks, JP. So let me just end by... by, by uh... Uh, telling this to to founders that that get started in Canada, Canada is a, a is a very small market. Work as quickly out of the Canadian market as you can. So if you think that Waterloo or Toronto is your first market, don't don't look at the second geographic market as one that is thirty kilometers away. Think about Boulder, Colorado, or Portland, Oregon, or Tampa, Florida, right and if you find that, that it's difficult to get to them and develop them as a market, uh, then ask yourself, am I truly going to be a global company? You've got to crack that nut. I love it. That's some great advice. I'm going to use that. Brilliant. Okay. I love it. Thank you very much, Benton. Give me it's two been a pleasure, JP. You're a good man. Thank you. Well, that was awesome. Benton, I'm a big fan. Uh, we've... I've been working on and off together, I guess, uh, through uh, multiple angel groups, uh, from our events through to other events. But Benton's been fantastic. Really enjoy how he dives into questions, how he works with startups, uh, his advice on trying other markets. And if you can't make it work there, then are you really in a global space? Uh, man, just lots of great things uh, about giving back, mentorship. Um, what you learn from when you're uh, working on that first company, having co-founders, how important that is. So yeah, there's uh, a lot of great sound bites there and uh, really a pleasure to being able to chat with, uh, with Benton, even about all the sides of innovation. So pretty cool. Uh, like us, share us, uh, post it, all those great things. Thank you very much, guys. Have a great day.